Hello. And welcome to, Sunday at Bear Branch. A virtual ministry, of the Churches of Christ. We are now rebroadcasting the morning sermon of Brother Brian Barrett, who preaches for our congregation, here at Bear Branch, in Spurlocko, West Virginia. We hope that you will find the lessons profitable, in the study of God's Word, and enlightening to the Christian walk. Brother Barrett has been a preacher, and teacher in the Churches of Christ for over 40 years, a frequent speaker in gospel meetings, revivals, having worked in TV and radio, and now our internet ministry. We now invite you to open your Bibles and follow along in our lesson of the hour. Now, here's Brian. In our last lesson, we were going through the seventh chapter of Romans, getting an understanding. And one of the things we want again to bring out of that is, is that the law is not dead. We're dead to the law. In Christ Jesus, we are dead to the law. But throughout that, from the time that man and woman sinned in the garden, we've been under a specific law, and that's the law of sin and death. When we sin, we will die. That was God's message from the beginning. In the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And as we were finishing up last week, we know we have this law of sin and death. We know that we have within us a desire to do better, but sometimes we have difficulty figuring out how to make that work. There are things that we want to do, know we should do, but we don't. And there's things that we shouldn't do, and we know that we shouldn't, but we do them anyway. And so there is this struggle between the inward person, the inward man, and what we know and understand, and the outward man, which is the flesh. And in verse 24 and 25 of the seventh chapter, we'll use that as the jumping off point. Paul asks a question, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It is a living death to struggle with the things of life. And ultimately, the death that is imposed upon all of us And the answer He gives, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. And in that case, He's not talking about the old law, but He's talking about just God's law in general. But in the flesh or with the flesh, we have the law of sin. So the law of sin and death is still active. Back in Romans 6, verse 23, we find the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I I said last week, if you tune in this week, we would look at an answer for that question. And so Paul knows that the answer and the only answer that we can find is in Jesus Christ. I know we quote this a lot, but I find it to be a very important verse. John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And so we understand that if there is an answer, if there is a solution, that answer, that solution, that deliverance from the things of this physical life, is through Christ. And so with that, we we go into the 8th chapter of Romans where Paul says, there is therefore now. Now, one time, at least to some of his writers, they were living under the old law. And the old law only brought condemnation because every commandment you broke 
you know you're going to have to answer for that and it only brings condemnation. There's no reward for breaking the commandments. But now, there is therefore now. There was then, now is now. Now there is something different. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Before, as they walked under the old law and under the patriarchal period and all the rest of it, again, you sinned, there was that condemnation, and there was the hope that somehow, somewhere, someday, God would fix that for you. And that's what we've been looking at in the book of Revelation. They finally got their white robes. They finally got their white robes when Jesus died, was buried, and that He rose again. What condemnation they felt was removed as they were delivered. But we see that they weren't in torment. They were, as we know, in paradise. But again, they weren't fully redeemed until Jesus died on the cross. And so we have something now that's it's kind of interesting. We don't stop sinning. Paul says we still got that same problem. There are things that I know I should do and I don't do them. And there are things I shouldn't do, but I do them. But now, there is no condemnation. Before there was condemnation. But now there is no condemnation for those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those who are in Christ. Now, Let's go over for just a moment to the book of 1 John chapter 1. It's not a passage that most people are unfamiliar with, but I want us to see this in light of what we're looking at in Romans 8. 1 John 1 verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. There's where we get the point. Now, therefore now, there is no condemnation. Notice Paul didn't say there's no sin. Paul didn't say that now Christians no longer sin. Paul says that the condemnation, there is no condemnation. Now, in the first part of the sixth chapter, as it had surveyed the grace of God, we've already answered this question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul's answer came quickly saying, God forbid. But John even takes into consideration if, if we walk in the light as He is the light, and have fellowship one with another, notice it doesn't say that we have no sin. But we're walking in the light, we're having fellowship with one another, but it doesn't say there's no sin. What it says is there's no condemnation. Why is there no condemnation? Because if we walk in the light as He is the light, if we have fellowship one with another, then... The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. There is therefore now no condemnation. 
Now that doesn't mean that a child of God cannot fall. It does not mean that a child of God cannot be lost. Because again, John makes this point in 1 John 1, if we walk in the light as He is the light and have fellowship one with another. Well, you know, if and then, uh, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. But when you have a statement like that, you have to also understand the reverse. If we do not walk in the light as He is the light, and if we don't have fellowship one with another, then the blood of Jesus Christ will not cleanse us from sin unless again we repent. So it is possible for someone to make a decision. We have free will. We can make a decision to no longer serve God. We can shake our fist at God and tell Him that we have no more use for Him and leave me alone. We can do that. And if we turn our back and walk away from God, that doesn't mean that He's still going to save us. And here's where a lot of people, they talk about once in grace, always in grace, and they think that you can't be lost. You can be lost. But the point about being once in grace and always in grace is that if I walk in darkness and I do not the truth, and I again come to my senses, I can repent of that sin, and I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Men, God can fix that without anybody else's help because I'm a child of God. I can repent... I can pray through Jesus for forgiveness and I can be reconciled. I don't want to abuse that. Again, we can't continue in sin that grace may abound. Don't push it. But if we walk in the light, as His light, have fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and there is now, therefore, no condemnation that to them that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's the goal in life. We're not listening to the things of the world. We're not involved in the things of the world. We're listening to the Spirit. We're listening to what God has to say to us. We are walking no longer guided by the flesh, but guided by the Spirit. And therefore, now there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If we make that decision to, again, surrender our life to Him, walk in the light as He is the light, if we fail, which we will. I mean, it's obvious in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we'll confess those sins, He is just to forgive us. We have that advocate with Jesus Christ. And so He says, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There is therefore now no condemnation. He doesn't say there is no more sin. He doesn't say that He never sins at all. But He says the law of the Spirit of life, which to us would be the New Testament today. And notice that little two-letter word, in, I-N. In Christ. Ephesians 1 3 says, All spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This doesn't work for those who say, 
I really don't need Jesus. Or I don't need to be a Christian. I'm a, a good person. This only works for a limited few. And that's why Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, but I'll say I never knew you. The Spirit of life, the law that makes us free from the law of sin and death to which there is no condemnation are only to those who are in Christ. It's a little two-letter word, but it means everything doesn't apply to those who believe in Christ. It doesn't apply to those who are good moral people. It doesn't apply to those who think they're better than the hypocrites in that church building up the road. It only applies to those that are in Christ. And of course... We know in Romans 6, it's already explained how we get into Christ. We are baptized. We who have been baptized have been baptized into His death and we're risen with Him to walk in newness of life. Paul says in Galatians 3, 26-27, through faith we are baptized into Christ. We put on Christ and we, again, the Scripture says in Romans 6, we're walking in newness of life. Colossians 2 says that we are buried with Him and we are risen with Him. We are baptized into Christ and in such we are made free from the law of sin and death. It's kind of hard to grasp this. So, A child of God never dies. I, I, it's hard for us to grasp this concept because we see the bodies of those we love. But the child of God never dies. When we leave this life, when we breathe our last breath, the angels of God are waiting on the other side to carry us into the bosom of Abraham or into paradise. Jesus died on the cross physically. But Jesus didn't die because he told the rich or he told the thief today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. They didn't die. He said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I believe Jesus was telling him the truth. When they breathe, when he breathed his last breath, when Jesus breathed his last breath, the body ceased to function, but Jesus and the thief did not die. They went into that Hadean realm where the saints of God, as Jesus called paradise, awaits the resurrection. Now, the difference between Jesus and the thief on the cross, of course, was in three days, that body which Jesus had left was reunited with His soul. And that body was transformed through the resurrection into that glorious body that we all have. But nowhere along the way did Jesus die. Now we speak of people as being dead. We say that someone died today. But they didn't die. Their body quit working. They're still alive. And so this law of sin and death, the death, the word death shouldn't necessarily be seen just as the physical aspect of it. The word death means separation. And yes, the body dies because the spirit is separated from it. And that's why we use the word dead or death in reference to the body. But true sin and death happens that when we have sinned and we go to meet God 
unprepared. We are separated from Him eternally. And that is eternal death. Eternal separation, not from the body, but it's being separated from God. That's the death that we're trying to avoid. You know, sometimes it may be painful, but death is, I mean, it's one of the easiest things to do because your heart stops, you breathe your last breath, and that's the end. It's not a difficult thing. You don't even have to do anything. It takes care of it all by itself. But it's that concept of sin and death and carrying the condemnation and those who are outside of Christ are still under that law of sin and death. There is still that condemnation that John speaks of in in John 3. You know, those who do not believe in Jesus, who have not accepted Jesus, have not been obedient to the things of God, the wrath of God abideth upon them. It's like a dark cloud. They're separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, our sins, our iniquities separate between us and God. So we're spiritually dead. We will be physically dead. And some, a lot, according to the Scriptures, will be eternally dead. Not that they will not think, feel, or whatever else, but they will be separated from God with an everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory of His power. That's what Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 1. And that's to those who, again, do not believe in God or do not accept God or are not obedient to the Gospel. Those who know not God and those who obey not the Gospel, but those who know God, those who have obeyed the Gospel, those who are in Christ, those who are walking after the flesh and not after, or are walking according to the Spirit and not after the things of the flesh, there, there's no condemnation. There really is no death. There's no real separation. Everything is, is just temporary. Notice what it says in verse 3 For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, notice what it says. There were certain things the law could not do. And it says there was a weakness in the law, but the weakness was not in the law itself, but the weakness of the law was flesh. When we think about Galatians 3, 21 and 22, Paul speaking about the old law says, if there was ever a law that could have given life, it would have been the law of Moses. But the weakness in that was the fact not that the law could not have given life, but it was the fact that through the flesh and the temptation of the flesh and that law of sin and death, the law could not do. Because the only thing the law could do was condemn. It couldn't fix it per se after that you had sinned. So it's not that the law was weak in and of itself. The fault was with the flesh and the children of Israel not keeping the law. And if there is any weakness today, it's still in the flesh But the power of that is is that through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ, we can have the forgiveness of sins and therefore there is no condemnation. Notice verse 5. 
For they that are after the flesh, that's those who go chasing after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, you know, that, that live their life that way. For uh, again, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. The alcoholic is looking for the next drink. The drug addict's looking for the next dose, the next peel, the next things that are going on. The abusive husband yesterday, abusive husband today, abusive wife yesterday, abusive wife today. Uh, they, they just can't deal with the things of the Spirit because they have been consumed by the things of the flesh and therefore... Uh, we're told, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What should I stay away from? What shouldn't I do? What type of husband should I be? What type of wife should I be? What kind of, of son, daughter? See, that's the difference. Those who do mind the flesh, they say, leave me alone. I'm not hurting anybody. And if I am, it's just myself. For they mind the things of the flesh. But those who mind the things of the Spirit are concerned with greater things. How can I help you be delivered from that bondage, from that corruption, from those things that you've given yourself over? And thank God, uh, some who again turn their life around, turn it over to the Lord, can get off of the drugs and the alcohol and they can become better husbands and wives and children and all of those things. But they have to want to do that. They have to want to repent. They have to be willing to do the things that it requires to, again, change their perspective in life from following after the things of the flesh and follow after the things of the Spirit. And one of the questions that we need to always be asking ourselves is which one am I? There's only one option. We either mind the things of the flesh we are concerned with the things of the flesh. It consumes us pretty much 24-7. Or we're after the things of the Spirit and our delight is in the things of God 24-7. That we're always looking on how to improve ourselves, to help others, to, to show and to bring forth that fruit of the Spirit rather than the works of the flesh that we read about in Galatians 5, 19 through 26. Paul straightforward, law, sin, and death will get you. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. If he sows to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians, the sixth chapter. But he tells us in verse 7, the purpose behind all this is that the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Someone whose life 24-7 is about the works of the flesh. The Word of God runs off of them like water on a duck's back. It doesn't faze them. It doesn't bother them. Uh, because just like a duck in the rain, you don't need an umbrella. The duck don't care if it's raining. The sinner don't care if Jesus died for them. The sinner don't care what is better for them to do. The sinner is consumed with enjoying the things right now. The carnal mind is at war. It's, it's at enmity with God. And you can't make it subject to God. Notice what he says. It is not subject to the law of God whether you're talking about the Old Testament, New Testament. And notice what it says, neither indeed can be. 
I know lots of people who have worried themselves to death dealing with people trying to make them see the truth, wondering what else they could do to change them. You can't make them. You can't make them. That's what it says. It's not subject to God, neither indeed can be. You can't force somebody to change themselves. They've got to want to change themselves first. And that's why we don't have baptism and repentance somewhere else on down the road. We don't save people on one end and hope that someday they'll turn their life around. You have to believe and then you have to repent. And really, belief and repentance are kind of working together because if you don't start being touched with godly sorrow and have a desire to change, uh, neither your belief or your repentance is going to happen. It's, it's one of those things that takes, uh, again, the full part. So he says in verse 8, they that are in the flesh cannot please God because once they sin, they're under the law of sin and death. And once they're under the law of sin and death, there is nothing that they can do themselves that's going to deliver them from that. And the only way they can be is through the uh, law of Christ to be in Christ, to be spiritually minded. Paul says in verse 9, but ye, that is the church, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know, it is assumed that as Christians, we're under the guidance of the Spirit and the revelation that especially today we have through the Word of God. And so Paul says, but you who are Christians, you're not in the flesh. You're not walking after the flesh. You're not at enmity with God. You don't have a mind that can't be made subject to the law of God. But he does say if you don't have the Spirit of God and if you're not being led by the Spirit and guided by the Spirit then that individual, going back again, is, is none of his. None of God's children live and walk after the things of the flesh. It just doesn't happen. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. The body is dead. That old uh, physical, and the, the law of sin and death is going to take care of that part of it. But though the body is dead, the spirit, the inward part, is very much alive because of the things of God. Romans 6. The old man of sin has been buried with him, and if we've been buried together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That is, we will come forth out of the tomb with a glorified body, and we shall ever be with the Lord. And that's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 therefore, comfort one another with these words. You'll ever, they will ever be, so shall you ever be ever be with the Lord. And so these are uh, the facts as Paul gives them to us. And so Paul says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify or put to death, the deeds of the body ye shall live. If you, again, mortify, put those things to death. And that's what 
Paul says in, in Colossians 3, you know, ye who are risen with Christ, sink those things which are above where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Your life is hid in Christ. And when Christ who is our life does appear, then we shall appear with Him in glory. He goes on to tell the mortifier, put to death the things of the flesh, sins, put that to death in your life. Repent of it. Turn away from it. Stop doing those things. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 14. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. If we are led by the things of the Spirit, if we are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And those who walk after the Spirit, doing the things of the Spirit, listening to what the Spirit has given unto us, not only is there therefore now no condemnation, but it says that we have not only received the Spirit's guidance, but through the things of the Spirit, we have received the adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've been made children of God. We are the sons and the daughters of God. And it goes on to say, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Search the Scriptures. Examine yourselves. See whether you're in the faith. Are you walking by the flesh? Are you walking by the Spirit? Paul says, you, know, you, you can figure that out if you'll be honest with yourself. You know what your relationship is to God. But he goes on to say, uh, again, the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Again, back to John 14. As Jesus sat around the table with His disciples that night, He says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. And notice what He says, in My Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, the next part's the good part that goes along with this. It says, Lo, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What's he talking about? We're joint heirs with Christ. He's talking about his father's house. He's talking about the elder son who is Jesus, who is again making promises to the sons and daughters of God. You believe in our Father, believe also in me, who is our elder son, our elder brother. And he says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. And I'm going to prepare a place for you there. Where? In His Father's house. Because we're joint heirs with Christ. And when all of those things are accomplished and everything has reached the fullness of time, Jesus says, I will come again and receive you unto Myself that where I am, where is He? In His Father's house. There you may be also. Why are we there? Because we are the children of God. 
because we were not under condemnation. Because we were in Christ, we are not the flesh and blood children of God, but God has through obedience to the Gospel adopted us into His family. We were the children of perdition. We walked in darkness and did not the truth. But because of the change of our hard actions and submission to the Gospel of Christ, we have been adopted. We have been chosen by God through our obedience to the Gospel and have received that adoption so that now we are joint heirs with Christ. And it takes a lot to get your head around that statement, joint heir with Christ. What does Christ have that we're going to share in? And He answers everything. What does His Father have that we are going to be joint heirs of? Everything. Everything that matters in eternity. That's why Paul can say that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Which are you today, my friends? If you're here and you're not a child of God, before you is the opportunity believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God to repent of your sin, confess your belief, be baptized into Christ, put on Christ, walk in a newness of life. Or as a child of God, not walking where you ought to be through repentance and prayer. There is reconciliation. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and subject to the invitation, we would encourage you to come as together we sing. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time and study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time. May God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the churches of Christ salute you.